Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and praise the Lord. We thank God for this connection tonight. We thank God for this virtual Bible study. We thank God for uniting us around the corner and around the world. We give shout outs to those who are in the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, the United States of America, those who may be tuning in from across the water, uh, those who are in Canada, those who are in Mexico and the Caribbean. We thank God for those who are in Europe, and we thank God for those who are on the continent of Africa, especially Liberia, Nigeria, and Ghana. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We thank God. This is Shrove Tuesday. Shrove Tuesday. This is also known as Fat Tuesday. Uh, almost the same thing. Uh, those who do not necessarily subscribe to the Christian faith use this as a night of revelry. They enjoy the excesses of this day. Uh, in Western Europe, a tradition emerged uh, at the end of Epiphany, uh, a three-day period of confession and uh, repentance occurred in the church. Shrove is a Middle English word, which means to strive, to be better. So uh, those in the Western church would uh, confess their sins, lighten their burdens, and prepare themselves for the Lenten journey, where they would physically deny themselves of sweets and fat. And uh, that's where uh, the term Fat Tuesday came into being. But typically, without refrigeration, the people would uh, empty their cupboards. Uh, they would make uh, confections similar to donuts, uh, primarily pancakes, they would gather and they would eat uh, because they knew that for the 40-day season of Lent, uh, they would not eat such rich and fattening foods. So they gathered as uh, families and as communities. And some of that certainly has spilled over into our context. There are churches all over uh, the land that are celebrating Shrove Tuesday or Fat Tuesday uh, in their own way as they prepare for uh, the journey of Jesus or the journey with Jesus during Lent. And again, Lent is a word uh, that has a Latin origin, and it means to spring forward. So we are to advance in our faith as we draw closer to God. And of course, Lent leads us to the empty tomb, the resurrection, and Pentecost. So that's that little lesson. But before we leave this time of Epiphany, uh, and as we stand on the precipice of a brand new season, the season of Lent, we are going to examine uh, the fifth chapter of Matthew. We're going to conclude our teaching on uh, the Beatitudes, if you will, or the Sermon on the Mount for now. Uh, we may get back to excerpts from this sermon later on in the year. But uh, tonight our focus will be Matthew chapter 5, 
verses 38 through 48. Let us pray. Gracious, ever-living, everlasting God, our Savior, we do thank you and we praise you for this beautiful day. A bit blustery, nonetheless beautiful. And we thank you, God, for another day's journey. We thank you that you have brought us thus far by faith. We thank you and we praise you, God, for our heritage, our hope in you. We thank you, God, for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We ask you, God, to illumine our way tonight through your word. We thank you for everyone who is connected in real time. And we thank you, God, for those who will pick up this study uh, after we will have concluded it and those who will enjoy it in the days and weeks, yes, even the months to come. We thank you and we praise you for your faithfulness. We love you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We will start reading at verse 38 and we will conclude at verse 48. Uh, my reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Jesus has turned the burner up to the highest number. <laughs> I mean, Jesus has been on our case. He's been on our track uh, throughout this four lesson series. But uh, this is this is as high as the heat can go. I mean, can you imagine the people who listened to this initially? I would imagine that some got up and walked away and said, this man is crazy. He's either telling us that we cannot seek revenge for people who have hurt us, or he is telling us that we are to be subjects of abuse. 
and have no hope of justice. Or he's selling us both. Anyway, I can just imagine that some people said, I am not buying any of this. And they left him. I can also imagine that there were those who were attempting to make sense of this. And uh, they were probably disputing among themselves. Well, maybe he does have a point. Maybe this is our way up and our way out. And I can imagine that the counter to that was, he just wants us to be victims and, uh, and, and be satisfied with our victimization. I am convinced that that's not what Jesus meant. That may be how things were interpreted. And typically, if you and I attempt to interpret spiritual things uh, in the natural, that certainly does not work well for us. There is something that we don't understand spiritually Instead of throwing up our hands and walking away, especially those of us who have spent time uh, growing in our faith, growing in our understanding of God through the Holy Spirit, we probably need to stop, drop, pause, and, and seek revelation and uh, a better understanding of what God is sharing with us. In the natural, it just doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense uh, to trust and believe in something that you and I cannot see, hear, taste, touch, I mean, it just, this is why so many of us who would follow Jesus, and I guess I forgot smell. <laughs> this is why so many of us who follow Jesus uh, really, really, really get stuck and we just never grow. Because if it doesn't make sense to us, we just leave it alone. I mean, if we had a pair of scissors <laughs> right now and had a Bible at our disposal, we would probably reduce the Bible by uh, hundreds of pages. There are 31,000 scriptures in the 66 books of the Protestant Bible that we use. We don't use the ecumenical Bible, which includes intertestamental literature, uh, other books of the Bible called the Apocrypha. Uh, our friends in the Catholic community and the Episcopal community uh, use uh, those references. But with, with what we have at our disposal, if we would just take the scissors and cut out every page or every scripture that we didn't understand, uh, I don't know how small our Bibles would be. <laughs> They'd probably be pocket size. Uh, and shirt pocket size at that. Obviously, we would keep the references uh, that uh, we understood or those references that provided comfort and a sense of hope for us. But the rest of it, we would just uh, toss it out. And it is true that that's essentially how we study the word of God. And that's how, in many cases, the word of God is proclaimed. It is proclaimed 
and study selectively. But if the whole counsel of God means something, then we have to uh, engage in those passages and scriptures that we do not understand that make sense that don't make sense to us naturally and that offend us uh, our offense may be justified but we'll never know unless we wrestle with the scripture i know references to slavery uh, should offend us. Uh, references to women covering their heads and being silent in the assembly should offend sisters. And I can go on and on about that. But before we throw any of the scriptures away, we at least need to handle them, wrestle with them, see if there is a context or a deeper meaning and go to God so that we can separate the human uh, that is being conveyed and, and, and the natural and the limited from the spirit of God. This is how Jesus went about it. I mean, Jesus initially said in verse 38, he said, you have heard that it was said. <laughs> I mean, he went right to the Old Testament because there was no New Testament. He, he went right to uh, the law. He went right to the book of Moses, if you will and pulled out this reference, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes to us from Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 and 24, and Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19 and 20, and Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. I mean, this was how uh, retaliation, the principle of controlled retaliation operated in the primitive Jewish society. And that's how people thought that they were supposed to get along. You kill my cat, I'll kill your dog. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the bloodletting that went on and that still goes on? It's a vicious cycle. It's almost like the hundred year war in 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 Europe or or the Appalachian. Uh, war, if you will, between two families known as the Hatfields and the McCoys. I mean, something starts and it never stops. And all it does is exact intergenerational pain and suffering and no one gets any better. So Jesus says there's got to be another way. <laughs> But if you and I only know one way, if we only operate according to uh, natural and human impulse, it is the impulse of us to uh, respond to violence, to respond to uh, disrespect, abuse in like manner in like manner. And Jesus says, I, I don't want to take the fight from you. I, I know how you feel. And he was speaking to a group of people who were primarily oppressed. They were oppressed 
by geopolitical realities. They were oppressed uh, by religion. They were oppressed by ethnic strife. They were oppressed. I mean, racism is a social construct. I, I don't know if they were dealing with that. Uh, we may argue that they were, but I promise you, uh, racism only came to the fore uh, in the, the 1500s or so. Somebody invented this idea. Now we, and, and, but they did go to the Bible now. They, they went to the book of Genesis where uh, a son of Noah found him in a drunken stupor. And instead of covering his father, he went out of the tent and told everybody that his father was drunk. And that son's name was Ham. And subsequently Ham was cursed and he was supposed to be a servant to his other brothers, Shem and Japheth. And, and somebody said, well, that, that, that must be the reason why uh, all of the dark-skinned people are inferior because they, uh, by God, were cursed to serve the lighter-skinned people in the world. Now, keep in mind, it was... Uh, a man who cursed another man. It wasn't God cursing a man. But uh, we, we didn't read that in the story. We just took it because we were looking, some people who were in a position were looking for justification to oppress other people. So, so Jesus says at some point, all of this foolishness has got to stop. And what I want to do is to give you a strategy of disarmament. I want you to be able to disarm people. You may be victimized, but you don't have to live a life of victimization. And he gives three extreme examples. Now, take them literally if you want to. That's fine, if that's what you want to do. But if you take them spiritually, what is he doing is establishing a principle because when people strike at you, they expect and they brace themselves for you to strike back. But what if you decided to do it differently? It actually would drive your enemies crazy if you really thought about it. And if you let God lead, guide, and direct you in terms of how to handle the situation. I love the story uh, that Howard Thurman one of the greatest mystics and theologians uh, that the world has ever known, wrote in his autobiography with head and heart. Talked about his mom uh, growing up uh, as a sharecropper and uh, how she took pride in her little plot of land. But uh, the the lady of the house, the lady of the land, if you will, the land holders or land owner's wife uh, had a mean streak. And it just so happened that uh, Howard Thurman's mother uh, had a plot of land that she worked and, and it was independent of working the fields. But uh, the woman uh, who happened to be white, she was white, ordered that uh, the droppings from the chicken coop that was close to uh, Mother Thurman's little plot of land that she liked to work, 
was emptied onto it. And it was such an indignity. And, uh, but she said nothing aloud for years. And as time unfolded, uh, the white lady uh, became ill and was confined to her bed. And Howard Thurman's mother heard about it and she decided that she would pay the lady a visit. And uh, she prepared a meal. Now you talk about being a Christian. <laughs> and, and, and just when she was getting ready to leave the house, she thought of something, uh, leave her little house uh, to go to the big house. She thought of something and she grabbed her shears, her, 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 her garden uh, scissors. And she cut a dozen of uh, one dozen beautiful yellow roses. And she tucked them in the little basket that she had and she went to the house and uh, she gained entry and uh, went into the bedchamber of the lady. Uh, and, and the woman's eyes were transfixed on the roses. She could smell the food. She thanked uh, Mother uh, Thurman uh, for uh, coming. But she said, where did you get those beautiful roses? <laughs> oh my God. And that gave her an opportunity to testify. She said, you know, uh, I have to be honest. Uh, you had uh, the chicken coop cleaned and uh, the folks who cleaned the coop through the droppings on the little bit of land that you assigned for my family. And she said, it, it enraged me. It, it you know, it, it actually made me hate you for a while. But uh, since I know, and, and I know I'm taking a little liberty with this story, I've lived with it for quite a while. You, you can read it for yourself. Uh, Howard Thurman tells it a lot better than me. I'm just giving you uh, the Lawrence Foster version of it. But uh, since I know that uh, I could hear Sister uh, Thurman say, since I know that God is love, I, I knew I had to deal with this hatred that I had for you. So after uh, being angry, I learned what to do every time uh, the hired hands would throw the chicken uh, poop on my side of the fence. I would just work it in the soil. I just work it in the ground. And that's where I planted my rose bushes. <laughs> and she said, I must admit, God has given me some beautiful roses because of you. I didn't understand it initially, but God showed me how to turn those chicken droppings into rich fertilizer. It allowed me to grow beautiful roses, so I brought you some. See, see, that's what, see, God will show us how to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, because it's, at some point, uh, the cycle of violence must be broken. The curse of revenge must be reversed. God will show us how to do it. <laughs> God, God will show us. God will show us how to do it. I wish somebody would help me holler tonight. And I'm looking for God because you and I get frustrated. We get frustrated. When, when, when people do us wrong, we, we get frustrated when people uh, change up on us. We, we get frustrated when people disappoint us. We, we get frustrated 
when people play us for sound. <laughs> yes, we do. And, uh, and but but you know, if, if we use that frustration in in its raw form, and we don't let God harness it and handle it and reshape it and refashion it and remold it, all of that stuff will eat us alive. It'll eat us up, make us bitter. Uh, it'll ruin our, our, our personality and cause us to become the very same thing that we oppose. And the last thing in the world that any of, any of us ought to want to be is our like our enemies. Now, I could go a whole lot further, but we just don't have a lot of time tonight. Uh, I, I wish that we did. You know, there, there is a time when uh, a, a defense uh, is, is absolutely, positively necessary. But even when... We have to uh, resort to a legitimate defense to preserve life. We still ought to do it, not gleefully, but we ought to do it sorrowfully, contritely, with a broken heart. Uh, I'll just say this, because I don't want to get off track, but... Uh, one of the courses that I took uh, as I was preparing for ministry was entitled Christian Ethics. And uh, my professor, who was, was very, very brilliant and very patient, uh, challenged me because I thought that I was a pacifist, that uh, I didn't believe in war and, and under no circumstance should uh, humans engage in war? And that's true. We shouldn't. But he challenged me. He said, if you were in the nursery of a hospital and you saw a bunch of infants, they were just coming into the world. And a deranged person came into the nursery and started slaughtering the children. Would you just stand there and pray? Or would you do whatever was in your power to stop that person from killing other innocent people or babies? I said, I would do everything in my power to stop that person. He said, you may have to kill that person. I said, oh God. But he was right. He said, there are times when you have to resist evil in that regard, but you don't do it with a gleeful heart. You don't do it to exact revenge. You do it and, and, and it should break your heart that you have to do it. You ought to pray for forgiveness and pray uh, that, that life gets better. But sometimes you, you have to do that. I'm just grateful that what Jesus is talking about in this particular passage is far short of that extreme. And, and we ought to be able to handle this. Uh, not to return evil for evil, but to overcome evil with good. You know, when, when, when someone uh, lunges at you, instead of lunging back, you step back and throw them off balance. Share this one other little thing with you. Um, 
at one point I had to travel uh, for my job and I had to travel uh, 60 miles one way a couple of times a month to attend uh, a meeting. And uh, I wasn't always on time. <laughs> and uh, a couple of people took note of that. And uh, they told uh, the CEO uh, that I was, I was lacking and slacking. And it was brought to my attention. And I knew that the people who were the informants uh, meant me no good. They, they didn't want me to have a seat at the table. And uh, initially I pouted about it and uh, started plotting and planning against them. But the Holy Spirit interrupted my conspiracy. <laughs> and said, now, first of all, they're right. You're late. So what I want you to do is to tighten up your schedule so that you can be on time. If you have to leave 30 minutes earlier than normal, you're going to beat them to the conference room. Now, that was a strategy. And uh, I got myself up, got myself together, uh, went to bed earlier the night before pressed my way. Sometimes it was snowing. It was icy. Uh, sometimes there was uh, traffic. But I stopped showing up late. And I noticed that because I was coming uh, to the conference room of the administration building, sometimes 15 20 minutes earlier than when the meeting started. These folks that were accusing me of being late were late. <laughs> they started slipping in, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes uh, after uh, the nine o'clock hour when we were supposed to meet and came in with a mouthful of excuses. And I was just sitting there, didn't say a word. And then one day I had a chance to break bread with the chief protagonist. His sister really had it out for me. And we had a chance to to share lunch together. And I'm not going to call her name because it's not important. But I thanked her. I said, you know what? You have really helped me. And she said, how? I said, you won't understand, but I just appreciate you. See, God will use people to put us on our knees and then put us on our toes so that we can be correct. I needed that. And I mean, it, it, I, I dropped all of my grudges. I stopped feeling some kind of way uh, because I got myself together. See, sometimes you and I need to examine ourselves. That's what we're going to be doing uh, through this season of Lent. Yeah. We're going, we're, going, we're going to tighten up our game, aren't we? <laughs> we're going to get ourselves together, aren't we? We're going to take a good look at ourselves so that we can look at others differently, aren't we? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I'll never forget that. Yeah, so it, it, it helped me. It helped me. Yeah, I had to go the extra mile. <laughs> I had to show up early. Uh, and I, I exhibited graciousness. 
The folks expected me to come in with a chip on my shoulder because I had to get there earlier. I had to drive the longest distance. But I, 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 didn't, I didn't exhibit anything that they wanted me to exhibit. Never, never, never said a mumbling word. I just got there. I was ready when, when the meeting was supposed to start. Then, then a few, on a few occasions, the CEO showed up late. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let me finish. Let, let's go to verse 43 through 48, and I'll be through. I promise you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's what it says. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your heavenly, of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Sometimes we're righteous, sometimes we're unrighteous. And God still allows the sun to shine on both sides of the street. So when it comes to this love thing, we may not love the actions of people, but we still have to love them. And that's tough. We can't do that without the power of God. I hear people say, I've, I've heard it, I, I grew up with this uh, conventional thought that we're supposed to uh, hate the sin, but love the sinner. I, 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 I'm not that, I, I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> Only by the power of God, I can navigate and negotiate that. Because sometimes uh, the quote unquote sin that somebody is practicing is so ingrained uh, in their psyche, in their personality, that there doesn't seem to be a way to separate. Them from their actions. This is why we speak negatively about people who are offensive. And a lot of people who are chief offenders are projecting. <laughs> you know, they'll call you out and, and, and they're in their own stuff. But they figure that if they can uh, call you out on things that they're doing that it will deflect or turn attention away from them and then have us have some kind of inferiority complex about ourselves. But in the name of Jesus, that is not so. <laughs> but but this is this is what I love. Jesus says, listen, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? He says, even the tax collectors do the same. And if you only greet, if you, and if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? If you're going to pursue and if you're going to achieve higher righteousness, you've got to be better. There's a more excellent way. And, and we have to be careful that, there, that, that you and I engage in that kind of tit for tat. I mean, I know you can't make anybody speak to you. 
And you know some people that don't like you. But if the Lord blesses you uh, to get close enough to them, you speak anyway, even if they don't say anything. Don't let that spirit crawl into you. They may suck their teeth and roll their eyes and snarl. But you have the upper hand. <laughs> Just say hello. God bless you. And keep stepping. I promise you, not that you want it necessarily to, but it will eat away at them before it eats you up. They will, they will spend more time talking about you. You will wind up <laughs> renting free space in their heads. And you can evict them from your heads in Jesus' name. So Jesus says, finally, he says, to conclude the matter, I want you to be perfect. Even as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, please understand that we are to pursue perfection. Perfection. Perfection is not flawlessness. We won't be flawless until we fully inherit what God has for us. When we see Jesus face to face, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. But in the context of this particular lesson, perfection is synonymous with maturity. <laughs> Somebody's got to be the adult in the room. Somebody's got to be able to handle the situation. Speak, Lord. Somebody's got to be bigger. Somebody's got to rise above pettiness. Yeah, that, that's where Jesus wants us to be. He wants us to pursue this kind of wholeness and maturity Spiritual maturity. And we can't do it on our own. We've got to ask God to help us. We've got to ask the spirit of the living God to fall fresh on us. And I promise you, if you ask, God will grant it. If you really want it. People may attempt to shake you, but they can't break you <laughs> in Jesus' name. And if you're right, God will fight your battle. God will do it. I'm so grateful uh, to... Uh, to spend this this last day <clears throat> of this wonderful season of Epiphany on a high note with you. You and I ought to want to be everything that God wants us to be. We really ought to want that. So I've decided to make Jesus my choice. How about you? I know that there are other ways to live. I know there are other ways to respond. 
But I want to do it Jesus' way. Though the road is rough and the going gets tough and the hills are hard to climb. I just want to do it Jesus' way. Because my way does, my way falls short. I mean, if it were left up to me, I would throw hands and lay on hands. <laughs> Might feel good momentarily. But my white, but I might wind up catching a case. <laughs> Don't want that. Guide my feet. Hold my hand. Guide my tongue. <laughs> Stand by me while I run this race. <laughs> For I don't want to run this race in vain. Glory to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you, God, for... You're refreshing this evening. Reset us, recalibrate us, renew us, restore us. Give us clarity. Give us insight, give us vision. Help us to be better. May people know that we are your followers, not by our Bibles or our bumper stickers, but by our love. There is a more excellent way. Help us to, re to pursue perfection in you, maturity, wholeness. Help us to be bigger and better. We can handle it if we hold to your unchanging hands, whatever it is. We thank you, God, for giving us strategies for victory through your teachings, through your word. Soothe every doubt, calm every fear. Heal every body, mind, and spirit. Make us whole. Open doors, make ways. Give us strength to climb every mountain. Give us power to walk on the troubled waters of life. Give us peace that surpasses human understanding. Give us joy in every morning. Enlarge our territories. Bless us indeed. Help us to touch somebody, reach somebody, help somebody, encourage somebody, share with somebody.
Help us to know that everything, every little thing is going to be all right. And what you said you will do. Help us to wait on you and be of good courage. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Boy, oh boy. It's real good. <laughs> we thank God. So I have a couple of choices and I just love Lucretia Campbell. So I guess, and I played her a number of times. I love this song. And uh, so if I played it too much, if I've overplayed it for you, please forgive me. <laughs> but I'm gonna play it one more time. I've decided to make Jesus my choice.
pray that you have decided to make Jesus your choice. That's a good choice to make tonight. Thank and praise God. We thank and praise God. Now, it's supposed to be icy and dicey tomorrow. And uh, we are prepared uh, to worship tomorrow. But I need you to use wisdom. We wanted to have, we want to have uh, two experiences. The distribution of the ashes from one to two. You drive up and the ashes will be distributed on your forehead. <laughs> and then at 6 p.m., we would have, we will have, if the Lord says the same, in-person worship. The snow is easier to handle than the ice. So we just have to pay attention to the skies. Uh, this uh, weather may, uh, may pass us by, we don't know. But uh, just uh, use wisdom. <clears throat> and if you happen to slip and slide and come to the church and you see the church is closed, that means that the pastor couldn't get down the street. <laughs> so, but we will have Ash Wednesday worship. Whether it is in the sanctuary or whether it is in my home studio. <laughs> so I want you at six o'clock tomorrow night uh, to tune in. You'll get the notification. I've already uh, curated the music and it'll just be an ashless Ash Wednesday. But we're going to focus and we're going to prepare ourselves for the Lenten journey regardless of the weather. But don't get out if you feel that it is unsafe to travel, all right? That's how we'll do it. We'll keep it simple. God will work out the details, okay? Amen. <laughs> now, Sunday is African Heritage Sunday at the church. It's our last Sunday of Black History Month. If you have uh, any African attire, wear it. If you don't, come anyway. But uh, let's celebrate how far God has brought us, knowing that the same God who has brought us along the way will take us all of the way, the rest of the way, in Jesus' name. Join the conference call line Thursday night if you'd like to have fellowship from 7 to 8. And then Friday night, join the conference call line for corporate prayer. I'm looking forward to this Lenten journey with you as we follow the footprints of Jesus leading the way. Love you. Have a peaceful evening. God bless.